Hi, welcome to the green space. I'm Jennifer Sendra. I'm the producer here. Are any of you here for the first time ever? <laughs> nice. How did you hear about this event? Email. That particular woman sitting right there. Nice. <laughs> Email. Pen, maybe? Yeah. yeah, makes sense. Okay, great. Well, we're WNYC's living room. We, um, we have some intense conversations in here. We have intimate performances. We play music. We make radio and podcasts with 100 or so friends. That's you tonight. So welcome. We're live streaming video right now on the internet. Um, it's all pointed at me, though, so don't worry. You can still like scratch your cheek and stuff like that. Um, before we get started, do silence anything that you have that rings or beeps or any of that kind of stuff. Are any of you members of WNYC or WQXR? Nice, thank you. So we're listener-supported public radio, so everything we do is supported by you. Also, the Jerome L. Green Foundation and our 2017 sponsor, Audible.com. And we do about a dozen events here every month, but in May, we're going a little nuts. We're doing 20 of them. And uh, you got a flyer on your way in, I hope, that tells you a little bit about some of the series we have. I'll just tell you about a few. We have an artist in residence here this month. Her name's Dessa. She's a musician and an artist and a writer. And she'll be here with other musicians and some scientists, and I mean like real scientists who do TED Talks and stuff, not just like the boring kind that stay in lab like really good ones. Um, come on, you guys. Like, it's alternative facts. Um, <laughs> Des is going to be here, um, and they're going to be here to break down what it is to fall out of love. And uh, the show involves a stage prop we call the Disco Brain, so don't miss that. Um, it's a four-part series called Heartbreakers. The New York Guitar Festival is going to be in residence here in May and June. If you do listen to WNYC Radio, Brian Lehrer does a live show here every month. It is well worth calling out of work sick to attend. It's a lot of fun. He gets great guests, and it's fun to see Brian live. If you don't know what he looks like, he's very charming in person. Um, we're piloting a new podcast. It's a game show for kids. It's called Friends for Now. It's a little funky. It's a little quirky. The logo involves a pigeon and a rat. But if there are any children in your life between the ages of 8 and 12, you might want to check it out. It's free. It's coming up in a couple weeks on the weekend. You don't have to call out of work and take them out of school for that one. And um, if you like to get a little weird, do you like to get weird? Just like slightly weird, lightly weird, ever so slightly weird? Um, this Friday, every first Friday, we have a variety show here. And this Friday, it's going to have comedy by Wally Collins, music by Jessica Rowboat, a cooking lesson from author and chef Gabriel Hamilton of Prune, and a performance by the Dance Cartel. So that's going to be really fun. And it's Cinco de Mayo. So, you know, you want to come to a public radio station on Cinco de Mayo. It's very traditional. Will you come back for one of those? Come on, Penn people, come back. Come back and play with us. So that's later. You're here tonight for the Penn World Voices Festival. It's the 13th year for the festival. They're doing 90 events in this one week. So that takes a concerted effort by many, many, many producers and volunteers and artists. We're grateful to them and the support of 5,000 Penn members that make it happen. And I want to thank Penn America for co-producing tonight's show here in the green space. And more importantly, we're really grateful to Penn for championing the freedom to write and believing in the power of the word to transform the world. Um, we agree with that at WNYC. We just say all the words out loud um, rather than writing them down. But we're all about that. Um, so join Penn, support them, find out more, get tickets for other events in the festival still to come at Penn.org. And um, I suspect you've all come out tonight because you're fans of one or more of the panelists. And um, they'll be out and will be properly introduced in just a moment. But I want to tell you a little bit about your host because I'm sure that he's new to you because he's brand new to us here at WNYC. Not exactly new, but new in this hosty capacity. Um, Tobin Lowe's a radio journalist and he's worked on a couple of our shows here. But as of last month, he's the managing editor and co-host of a brand new podcast called Nancy. Have you, anyone heard of it, listened to it yet? Yeah, um, you're with it. Um, <laughs> it's, it's on the iTunes and all the other places you get podcasts. Nancy's a storytelling show that's in the style of This American Life. You've heard of that one, right? I mean, that's what's been, been around for a while. Um, it's a storytelling show like that, but all the stories on Nancy are told from a queer perspective. And um, it's a really fun show if you ever wondered things like, who was the first Asian top? Or uh, is Dumbledore really gay? Um, these are the kind of, th I'm serious. These are episodes of Nancy. It's a fantastic show. Um, I love it a lot. I think they might be giving out cute little buttons with the show logo at the box office. I hope they are. They're adorable. Anyway, the show is smart and honest and warm and funny and compelling. And so is Tobin. So let's welcome him and our panelists who he will properly introduce right now. Give it up for them. Hello, everyone. OK. Uh, so as she was saying, I'm Tobin Lowe. I'm the co-host of Nancy. It's a WNYC's LGBTQ podcast. We are indeed on the iTunes, as she said. 
Um, yeah, and I want to go down the line and give everyone a quick introduction on our panel. So Ali Oscar is a DACA-based artist who focuses primarily on printmaking and live art. Edward Louis is the author of two novels, including The End of Eddie, an autobiographical tale of growing up in a French factory town amid poverty and homophobia. Garth Greenwell is a poet, writer, and novelist, including his novel What Belongs to You. And Andrew Solomon is a writer, lecturer, and an activist in LGBT rights, mental health, and the arts. His most recent book is an anthology of his international reporting, Far and Away, reporting from the brink of change, seven continents, 25 years. Thank you, everyone, for being here. So uh, since this is a literary festival, I thought a good place to start is to sort of go down the line and ask, what was the first character or story that you read that you recognized as a queer narrative or as a queer character. Um, and I can kick us off and say, for me, it was Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. I think Willy Wonka is absolutely a queer character. There's something about him that I think that character uh, resonated for me. So Andrew, maybe you want to kick us off? The first queer character. I mean, I feel I have to now one-up you on the Willy Wonka <laughs> thing and say that I had some issues about Christopher Robin and where exactly he was headed. Um, <laughs> uh, I don't know what the first one was, um, but I remember the first time I read something in which it seemed fully, um, uh, fully explicit. I remember reading The Swimming Pool Library by which time I was a lot older than you probably were encountering Charlie in the Chocolate Factory and having the sense that actual gay experience, gay sexual experience, fully adult gay experience could exist in a novel that was intended not only for gay people but for a wider public. Mm. Edward, how about you? Uh, it's difficult to say. I, I don't really remember. I remember that the things that I remember the most that my family would uh, put me take me far from any like queer literature or queer art or queer anything. So I don't know, I, di I didn't see anything. I think I, I thought that, that, that I was the only one. Mm. I, I thought that I, I was the only queer person on earth. I thought that I was sick. My father was telling me, oh, you should be sick. Why are you like that? And I, I, I identify some, uh, I was attracted to some men but some straight men that I I remember the very first time was I watched TV and I saw the movie adaptation of uh, L'Amant, The Lover by, by Marguerite Duras and there is this scene where uh, the Chinese man is making love to, to, to Marguerite Duras and I was crazy in love with him and <laughs> I was jealous of her but uh, but apart from that like homosexuality was completely or like queer characters were completely absent from my childhood, and not only absent, but banished. Mm. Was that part of the motivation to write about it so explicitly in your own work? Yeah, I, w I wanted that. I wanted to, to write about this, like, because for me, homosexuality or gay or gay life doesn't really mean anything. Mm. The question is in which social class this homosexuality is existing in which country, in which generation. And I saw almost nothing in common between my experience of homosexuality in my childhood and the experience of gay kids that I would meet in high school in Par or, or, or then at university in Paris that grew up in Paris in bourgeois, privileged, cultured milieu. Uh, it, was, it was something completely, completely different, precisely because my, the experience of my sexuality was the impossibility of my sexuality. The, the experience of my desire was the impossibility of, of enjoying, of seeing, of recognizing this desire anywhere. So, yeah. Gotcha. Garth, what about you? Yeah, so, um, I mean, much of that sounds familiar. Um, in public school in Kentucky, um, our teachers legally could not talk about homosexuality. Um, we were never presented any model of queer life that had um, any kind of dignity. My discovery of queerness though, um, I, remember very, I remember very distinctly when I understood that sort of a queer community could exist. It happened in Bowling Green, Kentucky at Western Kentucky University 
in the student center in a bathroom. I was 12 and the walls were covered with graffiti because it was a cruising bathroom, which of course I didn't know what that meant, but I remember how avidly I read, you know, these sort of pre-internet, you know, advertisements, right? <laughs> pre-internet grinder on these walls and the picture and the kind of revelation that that was for me. And that, um, I mean, even though, you know, no one cruised me, I was 12, you know, um, no one cruised me there, but it, it made me aware that those places existed. And my first experience of queer life is actually was cruising. Cruising was my introduction to queer life. And there's a way in which, you know, there is a strange universality to cruising. Um, so that, you know, in, in Bulgaria, where I lived for four years, um, I found a cruising bathroom where the, the sort of language of cruising was exactly the same as the language of cruising in Cherokee Park in Louisville, Kentucky, where I first found a queer community. Um, and, you know, I, I had the interesting experience recently of talking to older gay men in Bulgaria who talked about how um, in communist times in Sofia, where there was not even like an underground club scene like there was in, like, say, East Berlin, that these toilets, these public toilets were queer community, that they were where gay men would meet each other and where gay men could have relationships and have a sense of, you know, have any kind of queer life. Um, the first book that I remember reading that had a kind of explicit queer content um, was Giovanni's Room, which I found um, by accident in a, a bookstore in Kentucky that had a lesbian and gay literature section. And I do, you know, I remember um, what a revelation it was. I didn't know anything about James Baldwin. I didn't know anything about the book. I, I mean, I think I opened it because the cover was intriguing. But it was, I remember very clearly that it was the first time I felt like I was shown an image of what queer life could be that had dignity. Hmm. And, you know, it's a particular kind of dignity in Giovanni's room. It's the dignity of tragedy, you know. I mean, it's, it's not the only representation of queer life you want to exist in the world, but it was, it was life-saving. I mean, even though that's a, a pretty hopeless book, and it's pretty hopeless about the kind of horizon that's possible for queer people. Just the fact that those lives were represented with dignity and that that love was represented, that sort of, you know, the possibility of a kind of, just a love that carried with it some sort of meaning. I mean, I, do, I think that that as a queer kid in Kentucky in the early 90s, I mean, I think that that was life-saving. Revolutionary. Yeah. Yeah. It felt that way. Ali, what about you? It's a hard question for me because mm -hmm. uh, I grew up in a very anti homosexual society in Bangladesh. And for a long time, I didn't know like how to identify myself. Like, I had an encounter with man from very young age, from my teenage. But the word gay or queer or homosexuality, I came to know about all this term when I was in the university. And on, when I was like 18 or 19 years old. So, but after knowing all those things, when I started working as a social activist, I revisited, if I revisit those memories, I read that book written by Tagore, the very famous Bengali philosopher and writer, um, Chitrangada, which is, an, uh, which is a Tagore's version of Hindu mythological character. And after knowing about the uh, terms queerness and homosexuality and everything, if I revisit that character, now I find that was probably the first character I fall in love with, Chitrangada, who, who was born as a woman, but was um, because of um, her father's desire, he wa she was get teached as a man, but she wanted to become a woman again from the manhood. So I think Chitrangada was the first queer character, but I discovered Chitrangada um, very later, like five or six years ago, if I think like that, but yes. It was sort of a retroactive understanding. Yes, yes. Gotcha. Yes. Um, so I was seeing promotions for this event pop up in my Twitter feed, and one of them put the name of this panel as a question, and it said, uh, 
how do you portray gay male life today? And I have to admit, I laughed when I read it because it's such a huge question and seems impossible to answer. But then I thought about it, and, and all of you on this panel do answer it in some way in your work. Um, so I think we'll start with, with Andrew here. When you approach a new work, do you come at it trying to answer a big question? Is that the place that you start from? You know, I start from chaos. Um, <laughs> I think uh, I always uh, have a lot of big questions in mind. For me, there's been a long trajectory um, in writing about being gay. My first book, it was not particularly relevant to, but it didn't come up in. My second book was a novel in which I wrote very explicitly about being gay. And I became quite depressed during the promotion for that book, in part, I think, because of the stress and strain that were attached to me to that additional coming out of the closet. I mean, I was out of the closet to everyone I really knew. I was living with a man I'd been with for a while. We had a, um, a, a, a very acknowledged relationship. But going onto a world stage, um, a world stage, that's rather self-aggrandizing. I mean, it was a novel. <laughs> it had rather limited circulation. But going on what felt to me like the vulnerability that would be associated with the world stage was sort of a traumatic event. And I feel as though I've then written my way out of that and toward the feeling of confidence that I have now in, you know, as an activist going into sometimes hostile communities and standing up and giving a lecture in which I tell over and over again the story of my mother trying to get me not to select the pink balloon when we were at a shoe store and we got balloons to take home with us. I wanted a pink balloon. She told me not to take the pink balloon. Anyway, um, you can imagine the trauma that was attached to that. Uh, <laughs> I feel like the, uh, the larger question for me to some extent has been how do I reconcile the particularity of my experience with larger questions of uh, gay identity? How do I take the particular uh, experiences I've had, you know, now being married, having kids, having in some ways a gay life which is as close to my parents' life in its surface manifestations as any gay life could be, how do I reconcile that with a history that includes cruising and that also includes awakening in you know, public bathrooms to various, uh, in various ways? It's been a, a process of trying to figure out how do you make it into something, how do I make it into something which is even all the same thing to me, a unified sense of gay identity, much less a gay identity that then in some regard reflects what's out there. Mm -hmm. And I think the temptation too often is to come up with an idea of what gay identity should be and then shoehorn everyone into it. And I think that can be just as oppressive as the previous idea that actually gay people should pretend to be straight and act as straight people if they possibly could. And so I feel like a lot of the tension in my work comes from examining that, that difference. Um, and I feel like in, and I'm writing a book now which deals in part with gay families, and how they're formed. And I feel like in the battle to establish that gay families are equal, we've made a misguided argument that they are equivalent. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I feel that the children I'm bringing up are growing up in a household which has some things in common with other people's households and some things that are different. And I think, we could ask them, but I think they're getting just as good a childhood as they would be getting in a straight household, but I don't think they're getting the same childhood. And I feel like when I was growing up and there was a sense, and I, I think I'm the elderly person on this panel, but when I was growing up there was still a sense that, um, you know, in many um, instances in the United States, uh, uh, you know, that gayness was illegal and illicit and that it was much more marginal than it feels even under this current administration. Um, I feel like there was the passage from that to this sort of bourgeoisification of gay life. And the question of how you find an authentic gay identity is very troubled. And I had a moment of kind of revelation when my father, who had been only mildly homophobic in the, when I first came out, but he definitely was not thrilled about it, and then had sort of come round and very much embraced me. But we were talking about something or other recently, and he said, yes, but he said, I mean, you and John go everywhere, and you have a family, and you're at a school. It's all fine. He said, you don't experience, I mean, I understand there's prejudice for some other people, but you don't experience any prejudice, do you? Mm -hmm. I feel like you don't understand the nature of that constant awareness of difference, the day-by-day -day sort of need to explain, occasionally to apologize, sometimes to insist, and what the, the toll is that that takes. And so how do we represent that without being self-aggrandizing and saying, you know, I'm one of the suffering oppressed people of the world, which I'm not. How do you get those balances right? Yeah. Garth, you were nodding through a lot of that. Is there 
is there something that's different in uh, writing of fiction than there is in sort of writing, capturing people's stories? Well, I mean, sure. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a different kind of responsibility or a responsibility to different things. But I mean, I do think that the job of the writer and the job of the artist, of whatever that artist's identification is kind of always the same. And it is to try to um, kind of pierce the stories we tell ourselves and pierce the myths we tell ourselves. And... Um, try to say something that is more true than those stories or those myths. I mean, you know, I do think that, <clears throat> I mean, I guess, you know, the idea of sort of, I mean, I, it does seem to me that um, pressure is put on queer people in these very privileged parts of the world in which um, queerness has been to a large degree destigmatized, which, you know, is, we have to remember almost nowhere. Um, I mean, you know, we talk about sort of zones of queer privilege on the coasts of the, of, you know, the United States as an example, even there, um, that privilege is, you know, just so, um, there, there is nothing sort of egalitarian about the distribution of that privilege. Um, so like what Edouard was saying about, you know, queerness means something different depending on where you are geographically, where you are in terms of class. But I would also say that, you know, in these very privileged places where a kind of discourse of pride has to a certain degree triumphed, even if that triumph is always fragile as we're being reminded now um, in, by our current administration, um, you know, in those places, there is a pressure to sort of subscribe to a politically effective narrative about queer life, about pride, about how one should feel. One, one sort of version of that narrative is, I think, what you're talking about when you say sort of the bourgeoisification of, of queer life, this idea that, you know, what I think is a trap to have fallen into a kind of essentializing argument that says love is love. There's no difference between the love that I feel for my partner and the love that a straight couple feels. There's no difference between queer families and straight families. And in doing that, I think sort of we have sacrificed, to the extent that we subscribe to that kind of narrative, we have sacrificed what is to me a kind of genuinely radical potential in queer life. And we've also sacrificed the extent to which a movement for queer rights can be considered a kind of movement toward liberation. Because I think any genuine project of social, liber liber of social liberation has to have as its aim, as its consequence, a multiplication of the models of life that are seen as legitimate. If because of sort of a, a certain fight for marriage equality. And I mean, I think marriage equality is an important fight. It's an important right. Um, it's important for queer families, not just in those zones of privilege, but especially in places where queer people are still fighting for their lives. It's important for queer families with children who are overwhelmingly women, overwhelmingly people of color, and overwhelmingly in the American South and the Mountain West. So the idea that marriage equality benefits you know, already privileged white gay guys on the coast is false, mm -hmm. like just demographically false. But if, I mean, that battle for marriage equality was won at the cost of sacrificing a notion of human affective relationship as something that can inhabit all kinds of models and forms and that can look all sorts of ways, um, I think we have given up too much. And if that sort of, you know, that particular branding campaign that was marriage equality comes at the cost of being able to talk in genuine ways about things like queer shame, um, you know, which is one of the things that I find uh, so moving and powerful about Edouard's novel is that it is a kind of extraordinary exploration of, of that. Um, if we can't talk about that, if we can't sort of look at our lives 
and explore them with all of the ambivalence and ambiguity that have become that our political discourse and our activist discourse has become incapable of accommodating um, then I think we've lost too much. And that to me is the role of art, to sort of carve out a space in which we can think with that full measure of doubt and ambivalence and ambiguity. Um, you know, that is, funda that is sort of politically problematic, but is the reality I think in which we live. Right, well, and I wanna jump off of a, a thing you're getting at, which is I think a lot of times with queer narratives, especially when they go more mainstream, there's a temptation to smooth the edges and, and come away from some of these nuances you're talking about. And, and I am thinking also of Edward's book that you deal very uh, in very real terms with the violence of queer life. Um, and I was hoping you would talk a little bit about violence as a tool in storytelling and how you think about how you incorporated that into your book. Uh -huh. Yeah, like, First, for me to, to talk about uh, gay life, to talk about homosexuality, or to talk about homophobia, uh, meant to talk about all the people. So not only me, but also my father, my straight brother, my straight sister, my straight neighbors, all of them. And that's why when I, when I, I got the invitation from here, I was a little bit upset that we would be just, like, just queer people on stage, mm. because I want people to realize that the question of homosexuality uh, is not a question only for gay people. And I give an example. In the end of Eddie, I show that my father would always define himself as a tough, straight man. And for him to say, I am a tough, straight man, meant I am not a pussy. Mm -hmm. I'm not like these gay people. And so all the way he was building his identity was a way of excluding another identity and to exclude me, to exclude his son, to exclude gay people in general. And in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the working class village where I grew up and that I described in, in, in the end of it, the first novel, the, like, the homosexuality meant was everything, you know? You were bad at soccer, you were a faggot. Mm -hmm. you, were, you didn't finish your plate, you were a faggot. Like everything was shaped by that. And even like the, the, the social class issues, you know? Because for example, my, my father stopped school at, at 14 years old because for him to build his identity, his masculine identity uh, of a straight boy meant to challenge the professor at school, you know? to not respond, to, to not be submitted, to not be, you know, to, to, to challenge, to aggress the scholar system. It was a way for him to build his identity as a, as a boy, as a man. And so the thing is, my dad now is as poor as he is because of his shitty job, but also because of homophobia, you know, because mm -hmm. he has to eliminate himself. He, he had to auto-exclude himself from school in order not to be a faggot. And when I, like, this last couple of months and years, I was hearing people saying, oh, you know the problem with social struggles, with resistance and blah, 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 is that we talk more and more about sexuality or gender and race, and we talk less and less about domination, economical domination, poverty, misery. And that's the way some people explain, for example, the rise of, of Marine Le Pen in France. You know, like we ignored the, the, the working class people and everything because we were focusing on, on homosexuality and on gender. And what I just say, like, proves that this is completely absurd. Mm. Because, because precisely the, the, the like, the, the social class identity is, is a sexual identity. My father was saying, I am a real man because I am not like these bourgeois who are effeminate and who cross their leg when they talk, you know? Mm. He was saying, I am. <laughs> 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 he was saying, I am a working class man because I am not like this pussy bourgeois who eats like very small plates, very expensive. I prefer like big food, manly f uh, food for men, you know, food for, for strains, food for, and like, all of that shows us that you know there is there is no there is no class revolution if there is no sexual revolution mm -hmm. because people are stuck in the life they are. My father will never have a different future. Will never have a different f fate. 
will never have a different life because of the of the like destroying importance of homophobia and because him as a straight man is as i don't know uh, if it's as like s stuck by it but uh, at least it's it's the homosexuality is the story of his life as well as it mm -hmm. is the story of my life and yeah i think so yeah well and it it strikes me that you know when i when i talk to other queer people we talk a lot about this idea of toxic masculinity and how it sort of pervades the queer community but as you're saying it pervades everything it's sort of all over the place and i wanted to open up this this idea to you ali cuz your work challenges a lot of you know, sort of gender norms or this idea of masculinity. Um, and I was wondering how you think about it when you're putting together one of your, one of your works. So after hearing from all of you, it's a very interesting thing. Because when I came out in Bangladesh in front of my family, when I told my, mo my dad that uh, I like another man or I like a guy, it was unbelievable for them because on their imagination, on their world of reality, there is nothing exists something like that. Mm -hmm. So for, for my mom, it's very tough for her to understand where I'm coming from. For my dad, it's very tough for them to understand where I'm coming from. My mom thought for a long enough of time I'm a transgender. She thought that I actually wants to become a girl because I was very effeminate. I was used to wear women's clothes when I was a little kid. So my mom's biggest fear till now, I know that she think I will become a woman one day. So on their imagination, on their reality, there is nothing called queerness. I can't manage them to understand what a gay life means or a queerness means. Not only for mom and my dad, my friends, my university friends, the people I worked with in Dhaka, the people I present my artwork in Dhaka, Many of them took me as like a less masculine person, or I'm not a man at all. I'm, become, I'm trying to become a woman. So one of my performances, I'm giving an example, in Dhaka, I, that was like it's three days, every day I was performing for six hours. I created a boundary, what I was telling gender-free zone, so people can come inside and retransform my body with gender objectified things. And, with a, and on the end of the, on the exit of my performance, someone came and gave me a, makeover as a drag queen. Mm. So I got comment from my fellow artists that, okay, you fulfill your desire of becoming a woman through this performance. Mm. So the whole reason of doing the performance and the whole reason of putting the message wasn't working all the time for me because people are not getting that idea that a man can like another man, a man who is physically I look like a man. I, that does not matter whether I identify my, myself as a male or female. But for them, it was more like I wanted to become a woman rather than I'm claiming that I'm a man and I can like another woman. So it's a bizarre kind of situation for me when I think about the situation in Dhaka and the context in Dhaka I was working. And on, and I, on the other hand, I wasn't actually answering any question when I, when I was doing my work. It's more like I was putting question in front of people because people weren't talking at all on this matter. They are hiding it. Like there is a relationship between man and man. I know lots of my friends, they are having a secret relationship. There is secret gay party. There is online platform. People can meet each other through online apps and everything through smartphones who have access on internet. But no one is talking about it. It's something like a hidden secret in the society. So when I was doing my work, one of my friends was telling me, yeah, I know you like another man. I get it. You are in a fifth minute from your school life. We, we, uh, we like you as the way you are. Why you have to, be so, why have to be, like, scream like you are, you are queer, you are queer, you are queer all the time? <laughs> why you have to say like you are gay? Like, we get it. It's enough. Don't <laughs> talk about it so much. It's a Muslim country and you know how the society is. Don't talk about it so much. So I questioned my friend. Like, he is a heterosexual man who is married and who has a wife. And every day I have to hear all his story about his struggle with his family and everything. <laughs> So I told him, like, <laughs> why you're so heterosexual then for me? Like, why all the, every day I have to heard about how much struggle you are having with your wife and your kids and everything? Uh, but it's hard for them, for me to manage, to uh, question their answer. It's more like I'm questioning themselves. Uh, so if that makes sense for all of you, I don't know. I'm explanatory enough about the situation and the context I'm talking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Was there ever a day where, it, where your performance didn't end up in someone dressing you in drag? 
No, actually, that was one of the most popular performance in my yeah. story. <laughs> all the newspaper loved it. All the television loved it. They all came. And I was in front of a Bengali newspaper wrapping myself around half nude with a rainbow flag. I, I have doubt how much the newspaper know about the meaning of having a rainbow flag. I was making a statement on my performance. My dad gave me a phone call, and he told me that I saw your picture on the leading Bengali newspaper in my language. You are wearing that colorful cloth in your body. So I was kind of embarrassed. I told my dad, okay, I'm kind of relieved on the other hand that my dad don't know what the hidden meaning is. And on the last day when I get the transformation of a drag queen, my dad called me and uh, I'm coming to see your performance. And I was like super tense that I don't want to face my dad like this. But that was also another level of understanding for me, probably the comfort zone I'm looking for. I'm not ready for that comfort zone. I'm not ready to face my family yet. On, the, on that, with that drag queen mode and uh, everything. So, because I also grew up on that society. I have all those uncomfortable feelings. I have also that uncomfortable uh, state of mind inside of myself. Sometimes, probably, I'm internally homophobic also sometimes. Mm. Because I don't have that courage sometimes. I don't have also um, the bravery sometimes to face my parents, to face uh, the society as the person I am. Gotcha. Is there a queer narrative that y'all are ready to retire that is sort of out there and has been done? Or is there such thing as a queer narrative that's been overdone? Andrew, do you want to start? I have to go first every time. <laughs> Sorry. I get to think about it for a bit. Um, you know, I think that the, um, uh, the narrative that's been overdone is the kind of the effete um, uh, uh, esthete meets the um, uh, tough from the working class and that all eros lies in that tension which is a tension not only of um, manner but also of identity in some um, in some profound ways. I think it can be done brilliantly. I think it can be done beautifully. I think it has been done brilliantly and beautifully. I think it's very constraining when it becomes the sort of dominant narrative. I just last week was at the Tate where there uh, in London where there is an exhibition now on 50 years since um, the, uh, uh, since the legalization of partial legalization of homosexual acts in Britain. Um, and it shows a variety of things, including, kind of interestingly, the portrait of Oscar Wilde that was given to him as a wedding present when he married his wife hung next to the door of the cell in which he was uh, imprisoned at Reading Jail. Um, and, uh, and that installation, that installation is very, it's very quiet. It doesn't make a point of sort of how these two things contrast. It's just there in the middle of the queer exhibition at the Tate. I have to say that seeing the rainbow flag, the aforementioned rainbow flag, flying over the Tate Gallery, which um, is, is doing for, I think, a full six weeks, um, I was very moved to see it there. I was moved to see it in that, um, in that officialdom. But I saw in the uh, Oscar Wilde story the whole idea of kind of the, you know, the person who has been brutalized by the society um, and who is uh, trying to somehow swim back into the mainstream. I think, mm -hmm. I think that swimming into the mainstream narrative is another one that could stand to be that could stand to be retired. I must say it was particularly compelling to me because I feel like the first moment you were asking when I first encountered a queer character, when I first portrayed a queer character in any very public way, was my senior year in high school when I was Algernon in The Importance of Being Earnest. Ah. Um, <laughs> and, uh, uh, and I, you know, years later, finally realized that the person, the theater teacher who cast me, was herself gay. She and I kind of reconnected in the Facebook era, um, and that she had seen this in me, and she was trying to give me a way of beginning to come out and to be myself by making that the school play my senior year. And I was deeply moved by that. And so on the one hand, I would say there are these narratives that need to be retired. And on the other hand, I would say through those narratives that perhaps need to be retired out of the present tense can actually come the emergence into a modern gay identity. So while they might be retired from new material, we should by no means be retiring the old material. Hmm. The thing about the Tate exhibition that was so moving, and it goes back um, to you know an artist um, uh, who was extremely well known in Victorian England and who was then caught in an act of gross indecency um, in a public lavatory, back to public lavatories. Um, uh, and then, you know, was a complete outcast and nobody bought any of his paintings anymore. So um, I hope that that narrative is one that is beginning to, 
to vanish that narrative, that particular form of oppression in that particular context. But uh, I, I don't think we should retire any of the gay narratives entirely. I think we should treat them, some of them as artifacts, but that we should remain deeply connected to them because without them, I think the acts of self-invention that we undertake become dislocated, disjointed, and ultimately betray us. Mm. Does anyone else have a, a narrative that they're ready to <laughs> maybe give a break, let's say? Yeah, I, I was, when I started to, to write, I was like, troubled by the kind of classical narrative of a queer people try to restrain to reinventing uh, himself, himself, herself, I don't know how do we say, um, and in, in, in a milieu uh, where people don't want to change themselves, where they don't want to, like, you know, the, the gay kid who is who was born like different and wants desperately to to try to yeah you know to to escape his community to escape his and I wanted to tell the story the other way and because I thought it was more true but when when I was a kid the first time that someone told me uh, you were faggot the first time that someone spitted on me and tell me you are different. Uh, I, I didn't want to be different. For me, that was the worst thing. I, I was not, I didn't feel that I was like a different kid that should, you know, achieve his different by like fleeing, escaping, reinventing himself. But on the contrary, during all my childhood, I, I, tried, I tried to fit in. It was, it was my biggest dream. It was, you know, my father was so ashamed when I was talking because I had this high voice, effeminate, and I, I didn't want to play soccer because it was so bad and I disliked it and I disliked the like masculine like environment of, at, at sport and and sport is often a very traumatizing uh, uh, thing for gay people during the childhood like you know the selection when they, they, they pick the, the, the teams and they never mm -hmm. take you and everything and <laughs> <laughs> you get you never get rid of it and and my, my father was so ashamed when I was talking and my dream was that he would stop to be ashamed, you know? My dream was not to become like a different person. And so during all my childhood, I did all my best to, to fit in, to be conformed, to be what other people would call normal, you know? So I did all my best to play soccer. I was practicing every day in front of a mirror to have a masculine voice, to not talk a gay person, to not... And I was learning the name of the football players. I was, I was trying to have sex with, with girls at 12 or 13 years old in order to prove to the other people that I was not, that I was not a gay person. And, and when, at, when at 14 years old, I went to high school, and, uh, which was not something usual in my family where people would stop, like mostly school after middle school. For me, I went to a school and it was a, it was a terrible a failure, you know. I, I, w I felt that I was forced to be different. Mm. And years after, I realized that it saved me. But for me, that was, that was a, 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 terrible, a terrible fail. I thought, why can't I fit in? Why can't I be like the other people? And because it was all the struggle during these years. And I thought that giving these narratives is much more liberating politically. Because if you say that, if you say, the kid I was, was not born different, but became different, even in spite of his will, it, make, it means that you, you can make people different, you know? Mm -hmm. That this, this difference can be created, you know? And it's so much more liberating than, than the classical narrative of, oh, you know, this, guy, this kid was a genius in a, in a milieu where people were like banal or even maybe a little bit retarded or like they were not interested in freedom and everything, which is a very violent narrative. I didn't want to say I was more clever than my father or I was more clever than my sister. I was not interested in it at all and it was false and violent. And so the thing is, if you say Eddie or John or Rebecca or I don't know, was not different but became that, then you force the audience, you force the reader, you force the people to be confronted to the responsibility. What do you do to make people different? What do you do to make people escape? Mm. And ju don't be like that next to your fire on your chimney and reading a book about 
an incredible person, an incredible gay person, and admiring this person. Ask yourself, what is happening? Because the, the, the fact is, like, queer people, when they escape the milieu, they, it's not because of a lack of social determination. They don't escape the social de determination. It's the contrary. They are over-determinate, you know? They, are, they have the social class determination, and they have a sexual determination. And these two determinations together create freedom. So how do we create determinations? How do we create the will of fleeing? And, and that's, that's why I thought about the narrative. It was very important to maybe not like get rid of it, but reformulate it, you know? Sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. I have to say, I spent many soccer games uh, <laughs> helping with the uniforms on this. <laughs> <laughs> you see? <laughs> <laughs> Garth, anything you're especially tired of hearing? No, and um, <laughs> and I actually I I think it's important to push out to push against the idea that queer narratives get worn out mm. in a way that other narratives don't. That there's something about the coming out narrative, um, say, or something about the cruising narrative, or something about you know whatever we see as being a sort of narrative trope of queer life, that that's worn out in a way that, say, boy meets girl is not worn out. Um, I do think that comes from a sense that sort of these deeply human experiences, like coming out, um, that these experiences are, are somehow less rich or less durable mm -hmm. in some way because they're queer. Mm -hmm. You know, to me, the 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 the, Ameri the living American writer who means the most to me is is the poet Frank Bedard, and he has a line in which he says, "We fill pre-existing forms, and in filling them, change them and are changed." You know, I think that much of the resistance to some of those narratives that people say they're sick of, is a sense that they are narratives associated with stigma. So in a sense, you know, this kind of particular sort of heterosexual vision of queer romance between the effete and the, you know, athletic. Um, you know, that these are, are, are coming out or sort of the, the miserable child who escapes, that these are narratives associated with stigma. But, you know, it seems to me that the whole history of queer art is the history of taking stigma and turning it into style and of taking a kind of punitive difference and turning it into distinction. And I find nothing more inspiring about queer art, which it does seem to me meaningful to talk about queer art and to talk about a conversation that's being had across time and generations among queer artists. One of the things that's most inspiring to me is how um, is how queer art can take points of shame and turn them into sites of production, you know, points of repression and turn them into sites of production, production of pleasure, production of beauty. I mean, to take stigma and turn it into the site of, of resistance. And I mean, that's to politicize it maybe in a way, I mean, because I, I, I do want to insist on kind of that excess of the aesthetic, to, to turn them into sites of beauty, the production mm -hmm. of beauty. Mm -hmm. You know, that seems to me an extraordinary thing. And, you know, these experiences that are foundational for queer life and that will continue to be foundational for queer life in any future I can imagine. You know, the, his, you know, the experience of coming into awareness of oneself as queer is almost always an experience of coming into, one's, into an awareness of oneself as, as different from the models that are most immediately available to one just because almost all queer kids grow up in straight families. And so it's just, I mean, even if you grow up in the most accepting family possible, as, as hopefully more and more queer kids will, it's still an experience of understanding that, oh, my life is not going to look like this model in which my life has come into being. And it's, you know, that is not an experience that gets worn out in the telling. It's an experience that is infinitely interesting infinitely valuable that can be retold again and again and again and again and to the extent that it is told by someone who is you know a, a, a powerful or a strong artist be the source of great art yeah um 
Ali, you were nodding at stigma and to style. Is that is that something yes, you I think love about? That thing. <laughs> <laughs> I think that goes so well with me <laughs> because that exactly happened with me. Mm. And uh, because I tried so hard on the first couple, like till like 23 or 24, to become a very good South Asian kid for my mom. Yeah. When in a very good school and like doing very good kind of art, making still life and landscape and becoming a very good student and doing <laughs> a good job and everything. But when I came out in front of my parents accidentally, my mom wrote me a letter and mom told me he's very, she's very ashamed about me. And that's the word shame really strike on my mind that why she's ashamed about me like i'm doing so much i'm trying my best to become a best kid but she's not satisfied and no matter whatever i'm doing for the rest of my life she will never gonna satisfy with me because of my sexuality or because of my preference the person i like in my life and then i start and my friend also told me that uh, sometimes i'm shameless and i'm like what shameless i am just because on the middle of a performance someone came and kissed me <laughs> and which wasn't plotted by me he just came and wanted to kiss me that's be i started become a shameless person mm. and i wanted to do the final shameless thing in my life i will do the extreme shameless thing in my life i decided on that day and i plan for a performance project without a single funding without a single money i the, whatever money i have on my account i started this project shameless and becoming all those mm. shameful act people think those are shameless mm. and shame is a socially constructed thing right sure. and different society have different definition of shame so i'm talking about the bangladesh definition of say, shame if i wear a lipstick for them it's a shameful because i have a, a, a physically i'm a man if i wear a sari if i wear my mom's bra that's a shameful thing for me. If I become nude in front of public, that's a shameful thing for me, uh, for them. So I started doing all those shameless act, um, and I tried to provo provoke people so much. People was provo it was like I get tagged as a provocative performance artist who provoke people. So people started building those certain expectation that I'll gonna provoke you. Like if I'm on the stage in Dhaka, people are gonna start thinking that I'll do something weird to provoke people, almost like Lady Gaga does in America. Mm -hmm. So. <laughs> <laughs> and then when I went to the trauma last year, I saw two of my friends getting chopped in front of me by the extremists. They're coming with an open machete. I think I saw the extreme provocation of my life because I was provoked that time by someone else and someone is getting killed with the closest person of me in front of me getting killed because of their sexuality, because of my sexuality. I can also be killed on that day. And after that, my current realization, you're talking about like, uh, like not to have one uh, queer narrative. I think the narrative I wouldn't like to have for my future work is not to provoke people anymore mm -hmm. because I think I'm already mm -hmm. enough provoked I believe I should try something else. I should try more about empathetic human connection and human uh, connection is important for me to build a new queer narrative in my work and with other people's work because uh, provocation can be in many ways and there is no end of provocation. Right. You know, I, I do think there is this this impulse, which is maybe a kind of just instinctive impulse and to a certain extent, it seems to me a kind of particularly American impulse to want to, you know, when there is shame, to want to deny it, to want to push it away, yes. um, to want to insist that it doesn't. And, and I, I do sense that among queer people. I mean, a narrative of pride, a sort of life-saving narrative of pride that exclude, that pushes shame away. I think shame is really useful. You know, I think shame, in some of the ways that you're talking about. I mean, in, in the history of queer art, shame has been the site of production. You know, when, when my father found out I was gay, he said to me, and I was 14, and he said to me, and I'll never forget, he said to me, so you like the little boys, right? The only understanding he had of what a gay person could be was a child molester, even though I was a child. Um, and you know, the, the question is like, like, I mean, you don't get to unlearn something like that. You don't get to unhear a parent saying something like that. You don't get to sort of, you don't get to not be subjected to that shame. And so the question is then, okay, well then what do you do with shame? And in the same way that shame can be kind of personally useful, useful in terms of forming community, useful in terms of producing art, Shame is also socially useful. You know, I think we have a president who is shameless. And when we have a president 
whose understanding of his own desire is that it is so entirely shameless that it carries with it its own permission so that he can say, I just gra I don't even ask, I just grab them by their pussies. I think, you know what, shame is useful. And I feel grateful that sort of my sense of my own desire is tempered by a shame that, that, that denies me the crime of thinking that desire carries with it that kind of permission. You know, in the same way, I think, you know, Kwame, the philosopher Kwame Anthony Appiah, who has written about the way in which shame is useful and necessary in sort of moving forward on issues of tolerance and human rights. I think the proper response for a racist towards his racism is shame. I think the proper response of a homophobe towards his homophobia or her homophobia is shame. I think the issue though, and something that I worry about a lot in our sort of current political moment, as someone who comes from red state America, as someone who comes from, um, you know, the kind of America that in the world I live in now is sort of the, the target of a great deal of shame warranted shame. I think people who voted for Trump should be ashamed. But the question is, what do you do with that shame? And how can you make shame not just a kind of destructive, repressive force, but instead a place of possibility and a place of production and a place for the creation of these kinds of human con connections that you're talking about? Because I do think that that's sort of what we desperately need in America right now is sort of some way for us to make shame useful in forging a kind of common national project that we can feel like we participate in. Yeah. That does not push shame away, but instead tries to make shame a useful force for reform. Mm -hmm. I'll just throw in that a friend of mine who felt that gay pride had gone a little bit too far suggested we organize Gay Humility Week. Um, <laughs> and uh, I thought that it was a, a nice idea whose time has perhaps not come. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but I think that you're absolutely right that, um, uh, that shame, I mean, there's a difference between the shame that we feel Donald Trump and the people who voted for him should have because they did something that was authentically wrong and the shame you may have felt in that encounter with your father where it was in fact your father who should have been ashamed of shaming you. There's a yeah. kind of reversal there. I think the sense is not that shame is without value, but that it's incorrectly distributed and that often there are people who are extraordinarily unashamed. I found a lot, though, I mean, you mentioned in your introduction, I've published a collection of travel writing. I found a lot of the time that the presumption of shame is frequently in excess of the stigma that other people uh, recognize or that they fulfill in their interactions with gay people. And mm -hmm. I was very struck. I had this extraordinary experience a few years ago, I had uh, met um, uh, someone who was uh, a local politician when I was at a wedding in Ghana. Uh, he got in touch a few years later and said he wanted to write a memoir and could I help him meet some people in New York Publishing, which I did. Um, in the meanwhile, he became the vice president of Ghana. He came to New York for publication, and we had a publication party at my house. And uh, a week after the publication party, the president of Ghana died, and he became the president of Ghana. And a few months later, his minister for children's and women's affairs um, was being questioned in parliament and uh, was asked, do you believe in universal human rights? And she said, yes. And the people questioning her said, do you believe in human rights even for gay people? And she said, even gay people have human rights, which resulted in a huge explosion of fuss and scandal, accusations that um, she was a fiery uh, gay rights activist um, on the basis of that remark. Um, and then somebody noticed that I was thanked in the back of the president's book and uh, published an article saying, that uh, a group of gay activists in New York had actually funded his whole campaign. Wow. I hasten to add that if I could swing a presidential campaign someplace, <laughs> Ghana is not where I would be focused. <laughs> 
But in the aftermath of that experience, and in the aftermath of it, by the way, there were more than, at last count, more than 12,000 mentions of me in the Ghanaian press. I mean, it became a huge national scandal. It was a picture of John and me that was at our wedding that was on the cover of the big tabloid there saying, um, Muhammad's gay pal marries man, um, et cetera, et cetera. But what was striking to me anyway, and where I'm going with this slightly rambling story, is that I then got really thousands of letters from people in Ghana. And some of them came from gay people saying, you can't imagine how bad it is here, can you help me get out? And some of them came from people saying, if you uh, ever set foot in our country again, I will kill you, you are the spawn of the devil, which is not so pleasant to wake up to in the morning. But the largest number actually came from people who wrote and said, um, we need to have a change happening in this society. You are brave to speak out. I am not gay. A number of them came from religious leaders who would say, I am a pastor, but I am telling my church, we have to change the way that we look at and the way that we think about these things. And I felt, to um, borrow from Garth's trope, that the notion of um, the stigmatization of gayness became a nexus around which a great deal of what I experienced as unabashed goodness from people who had no particular investment in the issue um, was realized. I will add, just in closing, that my favorite letter came from a woman who wrote to me and said, um, I have just divorced my fifth husband and think I should try your LGBT thing. <laughs> Can you tell me how it works? <laughs> well, on that note, <laughs> we're going to open up the uh, panel to audience questions. Um, if you could signal to one of our producers with the mic, um, we can get going with audience Q&A. Are we going over here first? Oh. Oh. Yes, why don't we, why don't we come over here first? Hi. Um, my name is Jonas. I'm 15. My mom actually told me I should come. Um, <laughs> but so I was just like thinking about this narratives thing, and I feel like I've spent a lot of time thinking about that as like someone who came out when they were nine. Um, well, I guess like people kind of came out for me. I was like one of those people that it was kind of just decided that I was gay. And I mean, I am. So <laughs> it's fine in the end. Um, but so in terms of like narratives that I'm tired of hearing, when I was growing up, all I had was like the two David Levithan books and Glee, like Kurt Hummel. Um, and I guess like the common through line there was like this concept of like, oh, it gets better. Um, and I guess like, on the one hand, while I don't want to say, like, I'm tired of hearing this narrative because I think those narratives can be beneficial to people. And, like, for me, as, like, a kind of effeminate, like, nine-year-old, it was, like, helpful to see that, like, oh, there's, like, this plausible character who's older than me and, like, they're getting through it fine. Um, but, like, what about the people where it doesn't get better? Or, like, I don't know. I wonder if, like, this narrative of, like, constant hope is, like, even plausible. Um, so if you guys have something to say to that. Yeah, is, is there something slightly dangerous about the it gets better narrative? Yeah, because... <laughs> no, go Please go. No, true, because the, the problem is like, who are you talking about? Yeah. That the whole question that you were posing. And um, it gets very tricky because like, for example, for all of us, we are here discussing uh, gay life and homophobia and violence against gay people. Um, and precisely, we are able to talk about it uh, because we were like, we, we had the opportunity to escape this violence, to not be killed by this violence, you know? There, there is a, a very beautiful, in another subject, but it's of course linked um, in, in, in his books, uh, Primo Levi, you know, the, the writer who wrote about the concentration camps, um, he, said, he said that when he published his first books, and, and, and the first one, uh, If It's a Man, uh, he used to say that he was, he, was, he was a witness of the violence of the concentration camps. And that's why, that's why he was writing about it. But later in his life, he said that more and more, he was thinking that it was, he was not a witness of the violence, because precisely, if he if he faced, if he experienced the whole violence, pushed as far as possible, by definition he would be dead. You know, he would not be able to talk about that. And so he said, and it was like kind of ironical but true. So he said, "I am talking about violence because precisely I was 
privileged at some point, even if it was like a, like a very, 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 very small, yes, that's why it's an ironical, uh, ironical privilege, which means to say that when you are talking about violence, it means that you didn't experience the whole violence and the whole, because you would, be, you would be dead, you would not be able to talk about that. And so that's why when, what you say is very important because when we are here talking, and in general when, when we are talking, the, the, we, we should not be talking about what is happening now, like what do we see now, but what is absent from now, mm -hmm. and always talking for the others, you know. We should be always like, there is nothing more beautiful, because then you can give frameworks and you can create some, I don't know, movements that will allow these people who were destroyed by violence not to be destroyed anymore. But yeah, like every, every, every single social movement in general, not only gay, uh, social reflection, I mean social in the most beautiful way about the world we live in society, sh should always start like, like that. Who is not here? Yeah. And, and, and yeah, so thank you for what you say. I think we are all happy that you say that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I saw a hand somewhere in the middle here. Oh. Hi, uh, my name is Oishek. Um I'm 28, and I came out to my parents Feb 7th. Um, so the, when I was preparing to come out, um, and I had this whole damn speech, which I never got to use because mm. I came out accidentally again, um, the thing was that when I was going through it, my, uh, so I grew up in Calcutta, so I'm Bengali, uh, the thing that I was going through was I didn't find any language or any words that I could use colloquially to describe being gay, mm -hmm. you know? Like I can use gay and queer and um, yeah. many other words here, but in Bengali I don't have a word. It's as technical as homosexual, which is the word in Bengali is shomokami, and that's the only word that I used. Um, so I'm curious to know, Ali, and if, any, if the rest of you have any thoughts, how do you... Um, when you talk about your sexuality, when you talk about being gay or queer, how do you describe that or express that in your own language? It's very interesting that I can relate to you in many ways because I speak the same language and language discourse is a problem. And uh, my idea of queerness in my language is very different than the Western idea of queerness, the gender pronoun and everything, blah, blah, blah. Um, there is obviously shamukam is a very technical word which means homosexual, and I am homosexual. So why I should change it, right? If I am homosexual, I should use the word homosexual. So I I don't think I, we should change it. Lots of my friends, activists from back home in Calcutta and in Dhaka, they were trying to imposing the word shamopremi, which is means same-sex lover rather than homosexual. Uh, so I'm not on the far of that. Like, if I'm a homosexual, I'm a homosexual. Yes, yeah, sex is a part of my relationship, and it's a very integral and important part of my relationship. So why I should sugarcoat it? So the, the heterosexuals, they're sugarcoating the whole thing, like with love and affection and blah, 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 and everything. <laughs> so I don't think we, I should sugarcoat it. I love men, probably I love lots of men in my life. And I do love having sex with men, so I should just say it directly. And people are not gonna take it easily for first couple of year, couple of decade, and one day they'll take it easily. You know, this is something that I thought a lot about, um, or that I never thought about until I moved to Bulgaria and started working with activists in Bulgaria. And I remember the, the first conversation I had with a Bulgarian gay man, which was right before I went, it was with a poet who lives now in the States. And I remember him telling me, you know, um, and this was, so, so things changed for queer people in Bulgaria in 2007 when Bulgaria joined the EU. That's really when kind of a, a sort of, um, viable LGBT rights movement began in the country. And one of the biggest problems was that there is not a language in which to articulate the idea of LGBT rights. And I remember this poet telling me, you know, um, the only people who had the sort of conceptual framework for this were, the peop were people who had been educated in the West. And it made me realize the extent to which, I mean, even though I come from a part of the country that feels very far removed 
from these zones of queer privilege. And even though as a kid, I mean, the only lessons I was taught about myself or the only possible, the only sort of vision I had of possible queer life was, was of shame. I still had this extraordinary privilege of the fact that I was born into a language in which these arguments have been made and a language that has a centuries old tradition of the articulation of human rights. You know, in, in Bulgarian, there, is, there are words for insults for gay people in Bulgarian. You can call someone obraten, queer. There is no native Bulgarian word that is affirmative. They say lugubatahora, LGBT people, right? You know, and then that, the, the sort of just how, realizing how much harder they had to fight and how much more work they had to do because they had to invent a language. You know, they had to invent linguistic resources in this language that had never, had never sustained queer community. There's no, it was interesting as my book was translated into Bulgarian, one of the things I talked about with my very brilliant translators was that there's no gay slang in Bulgarian or very little, or there's not a kind of gay slang in, there, in the way that there is in, in English or in French because there hasn't been a kind of sustained queer community. And just to understand that and to understand like the extraordinary luck which is just luck, which is entirely unearned, to have been born into a language where you can make an argument for the value of your life. That's kind of an extraordinary thing. Yeah. I mean, and it's, and it's important, I think, to remember that, you know, it's not just a matter of sort of, that sort of the terms of the battle have to be reinvented in every language, in every culture. They're not simply or easily portable. Another question from the audience. Yeah, hi, uh, my name is Omar. Um, I think what resonates most with me is this sort of discussion on conceptual frameworks that we were just having. Uh, as like an Arab American, uh, I really struggle with that because I identify as gay, but I also recognize, uh, and having studied this in college, uh, that this sort of like categories of homosexuality and gay and queer identity are Western. Um, they were products of 19th century psychology. Um, and so I was just wondering if there's a way to sort of recognize um, queer life but not sort of impose a Western language on other parts of the world. I mean, it's, uh, it's widely known that, I mean, same-sex relationships have been uh, a thing in like, throughout history, in Islamic empire, golden age, uh, where men wrote love poetry to each other in the Persian empires, but there wasn't that same language, there wasn't the same conceptual framework of a homosexual identity. So how can we sort of navigate and recognize that these sorts of categories aren't universal or essential? I'd like to stand here for a moment as an apologist for, um, uh, for some elements of colonialism. I mean, I think that on the one hand, there can be terrible and have been terrible exploitations committed, obviously, in the name of colonialism in general. But my experience, having spent a great deal of time in other parts of the world, including in the Islamic world, is that, um, as you were indicating in relation to Bulgarian, people are starved for this language and yeah. very eager to have it. And the idea of saying, well, it's a Western language and it comes out of a different set of experiences is it's a position which seems in the abstract very admirable, but which in fact often results in um, a terrible oppression. Yeah. When I was reporting in Libya for The New Yorker, um, I was interviewing a bunch of doctors and I met a medical student who um, was gay um, and who then uh, we were very occasionally and sporadically in touch over a period of um, uh, 10 or 12 years. I was living in the late Gaddafi period. 
And um, then Hassan got in touch with me and told me that he had watched um, a number of his friends being frog marched into mosques and shot in the back of their heads, and that he had fled. The only place he could get to was Lebanon. He had no legal status there. Through a long process, um, we were ultimately able to get him refugee status, and he's been living with my family for the last year. Hmm. And there is a lot about Western gay life that I think has come as a revelation to him, and some of it has felt very alien, and he's had periods of feeling very lonely and very bewildered and very confused. But the sense that there is a language within which to identify who he is and how he lives has made him into quite an energetic activist now in, um, in the United States. And he has talked about how he wishes he could give that freedom to the gay people he knows mm-hmm. who are still back there in Libya. So I think, and my, you know, I've encountered people in so many different contexts who have attached themselves to the, to the English language. I mean, I remember being in um, Mongolia and sort of looking vaguely across the street at someone who seemed to be looking at me and um, who was a shepherd who was walking through the streets of Ulaanbaatar with a bunch of sheep. And um, he looked at me from an and then he crossed the street and said, are you a gay boy? I am a gay boy. Mm. And I said, actually, mm. yes. Um, mm. And um, uh, I think that there is a, a real need for um, the models of identity that Western queer life and queer theory, um, but even before queer theory, simply queer life have put forth. And I think in uh, denying that vocabulary to people on grounds that it does not come from their cultural um, uh, background, we sort of deny the many ideas that go across many cultures. There are Eastern ideas which have been incredibly important to our understanding of ourselves as Westerners. There are Western ideas which have um, uh, their willing adherence in Eastern context. I don't think the vocabulary should be foisted on people who don't want it. But I think the sort of project of keeping people protected from this vocabulary on grounds that it's imperialist becomes its own form of oppression. And that there's more, there's no more dangerous idea than that of authenticity, I think, I mean, or of a kind of pure culture. You know, and the other thing I would say is that Michel Foucault was a very great philosopher, but no page has done more damage in the English speaking world of thing in terms of thinking about sexuality than the single page in the history of in in the history of sexuality in which he makes this claim that homosexuality was invented in the 19th century by psych by psychological discourse um, he rejected that when he read john boswell's work and when he met the very great historian of late antiquity peter brown he scrapped the rest of the project of the history of sexuality as he had as he had envisioned it because he realized that that historicization that yes it is important not to not to essentialize the forms that desire takes in particular societies but that that particular historicization that sort of says homosexuality was invented by 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 psychological discourse in the 19th century is wrong and that in fact queer communities or communities that maybe it might make sense to talk about using the terminology of queerness um, are much older. And that a sense of those communities as giving shape to an identity is also much older. Yeah. One last question from here in the front row. I have a comment and a question. My comment is I particularly identified with Bastian from the never ending story as a child, mm-hmm. like obsessively, to the point where I actually started writing out the story so I could relive it by writing it out by hand. Mm-hmm. Um, that just came to mind as you guys were talking about it. But on another note, I wonder if you could talk about uh, the particular responsibility you might feel now, or, or we must feel as writers, particularly in fiction to acknowledge and tackle the topic of the impact of the current administration. Um, I say this because I remember reading articles after the election results came out and it was put forward that art would have no meaning if people didn't just accept that this was the reality. Um, Yeah, like do you feel a particular responsibility for that, particularly in fiction? Do, Do you feel that it has to be addressed or, yeah, something like that. I am against 
anybody telling any artist what they need to make. And I think that, you know, art, I don't think art is sealed off from politics. I don't think art is apolitical or ahistorical, quite the contrary. But I do think that art comes from um, instinct and obsession and um, realms of the human that are not exhausted by or entirely answerable to ideas of responsibility. I also think, again, I would like to make an argument for the excess of the aesthetic and for the idea that um, the production of something as useless as beauty or the idea of one's own life as a work of art, um, that these are themselves meaningful acts of resistance to make something as useless as a novel, as unprofitable as a novel, by articulating a system of values that stands in distinction to the dominant values of a culture, that that is a very deeply meaningful sort of political act and, you know, I think it is what art has always done. To articulate a system of values that is not reducible to a dominant system of values, that is not reducible to a, val to a system of, of dollars and cents. That, to me, is meaningful work. And I think artists, artists have to make what compels them, whatever that is. And I, I do think... Um, I would never want to put any demands upon another artist about what I think they should make. But I would add to that that I think while you don't, and I agree with you, want to place demands on an artist about what um, he or she should make, you also inevitably in what you write or what you create are responding to the context within which you write or yes. create it. Yes. And I don't think that it is possible to be a writer in Trump's America and to write things which are not at some level engaged with the sense of fragility that so many values that have been held strong by writers now face. And so I don't know that you need to write. I mean, I have written quite a lot of anti-Trumpian stuff and have uh, done a lot of work on these issues. I don't think everyone needs to do that by any means. But I think it is impossible to write the narrative of coming out today and have it read the same way that it would have read a year ago. Because I think the sense of a society which is not in favor of difference and variety and diversity of every kind is a defining context. I think the exhibition at the Tate, which was planned years ago, as exhibitions are, has opened in post-Brexit Britain. In a Britain in which the things are not as severe as they are here, there is still a rejection of diversity and of variety. And I think that rainbow flag flying over the Tate feels very different right now than it would have felt if the vote had gone the other way. And so I think writers are inevitably embraced by their context. Um, I mean, I think that's part of what's so powerful in um, Edward's book is the description of um, how his own identity butted up against the identities around him. And all of us in writing about our own identity explicitly or implicitly are writing about the context within which it unfolds. And also maybe we like, because it's related with what you just said before, we maybe must not say like what people should do or why people should not do, but we should put shame on some, on some people for what they do. <laughs> like when people like Michel Welbeck publish what they publish is, uh, they should be ashamed. They, sh they should feel bad about writing it. You know, we are all like everywhere in the world now, we are, we are just asking the question, why this like far right, populist, fascist people are rising like that? Why is it so important? Where, and in fact, the, the kind of discourse, the kind of language that they are talking, uh, it, 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 it ex existed a long time before us. The, the, the difference is that in the past, they were, they were ashamed of that. And so we have a responsibility in that. In like, 
what language do we talk to? What language do, do we answer? I, 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 in France or in Europe in general, when, when my books came out, and I, sometimes I was invited to like panel, and they would invite me in a panel with like someone like, like Welbeck or some like, someone like homophobic, Islamophobic, uh, uh, misogyne, uh, and everything. And I just said, I don't want to go there, you know? Because I don't want to make his opinion legitimate. I don't want to answer his opinion because like answering it, it's to give it a legitimacy, you know? Mm -hmm. So maybe it's not about telling people what you do, what you don't do. It's our responsibility of, of what we ourselves do. Like, what do we answer? What do we not answer? And about all the politicians we are talking about and the current administration of the US, what struck me is that when I, I, I live here for six months now, and I opened the liberal newspaper. I opened the supporting left-wing newspaper. And when I open it, they only talk about far-right people, you know? And they are, mm. oh, yes, they are challenging them and, and everything. But still, they are talking about them. And, and, and they make the language become, like, bigger and bigger. And, and the key is, is, as you all were just saying, is the redistribution of shame. It's like, we are not authoritarian. So just say whatever you say we are just not going to answer yeah. because we think that democracy is the power of shutting down certain questions. We don't answer is Islam uh, dangerous or not. Yeah. It's not a question. Do a gay right and, and, and straight people, uh, gay and straight people should have the same right? No, it's not a question. And, and if you want to talk about it, just stay well back, go to the bar of your village and talk about it with the alcoholics. <laughs> but we are not talking about it in, in, in the left-wing newspaper, in the liberal areas and in the areas of creation. I mean, imagine all of the ideas liberal, the left in this country could be having if we weren't responding to every oh, one of Donald <laughs> Trump's tweets. <laughs> you know, imagine the ideas we might be able to have. And I love, I love what you say about that, that, you know, stop, stop, you know, just stop sort of repeating the formulas of outrage and instead try to do something productive, you know, mm -hmm. try to talk about a real idea, try to create a left in this country that has actual content, mm -hmm. that has actual ideas. Yeah, and Ali, you were talking that that is sort of where you're headed with your work too, is, is less in the confrontational space and more in, a, in developing empathy. Mm -hmm. Is that also a response to sort of what's happening in the world right now? <sighs> I don't know. I'm so it's sorry. Hard question. <laughs> Maybe, but it's more like a personal realization mm. because I do work with personal stories mostly, and I believe my personal story not different than ten hundred other people's personal story. Somewhat there is reflection, there is difference also, and on the point that. Uh, there is lots of censorship and lots of things happening for artist work. And you can't stop artists with censorship. You can't stop writer with censorship. At the end of the day, artist, writer, they will gonna do what they want to do. They will find a different way to express themselves. So no matter who is saying what, what is happening, how, artists and writers are the most powerful weapon in the society. So they will find how they want to express themselves. Yeah. <laughs> well, on that note, I want to thank our panelists, Ali Askar, Garth Greenwell, Edward Lee, Andrew Solomon. Thank you for being here. Everyone have a good night. <laughs>